Hey everyone, it's Neil Brennan. It's a Blocks podcast. My guest today is a guy who I used to go to tapings of his TV show. Is that true? That's totally true. I never knew that. Yep. I used to go to tapings of Mr. Show with Bob and David. Excuse me, sorry. Sorry. Excuse me. Oh. Hey everybody, uh, I'm David Cross. No, no, no. Wait, you'd come with us to the taping? Mm, <laughs> I would I would go. have remembered. No, I wouldn't. Or is he your brother? No, no, no. No, I would go and sit in the audience. 1994. Yeah. Yep. First one. See? All right. See, I told you. And uh, then he was on, uh, he was on, uh, it was Mr. Show. That was like five years. And then he did, uh, he was on Arrested Development. <laughs> I'm afraid I just blew myself. And the whole time he's been a great comedian and uh his name is david cross like and he has a podcast that i don't i don't i didn't write the name down <laughs> uh and he has a he has a new comedy special <laughs> called worst daddy in the world that's on youtube and he's got a few on netflix and you know All hbo over. They're yeah they fucking come on grow scattered up to the winds yes i used to go to tapings i didn't, no, I didn't go to like a ton of them but i went to a few of them yeah, it was I the i to explain to someone what like alternative comedy was at the beginning yeah now seems i mean it was 27 years ago or whatever or tw- well, 30 years ago 30 years ago it, there i mean um i mean that that uh, label came out a little later i think it was somebody from the la weekly did a article i'm young or what the is Times. the la weekly again that's one of those things are like, you serious LA, no i know oh. the la weekly is, but you know <laughs> what i mean like what is it mister a cd uh, uh all right Clean yeah. air. What? <laughs> um, tap it, water. It was uh, well. New York tap water is great. No, no, no get, tap make water no is fantastic. It, I mean, there is no alternative anymore. It's all no. pretty much that. But yeah. yeah, back back in the early, early, early days, eighties, I guess. I put the put the whole thing on Janine Garofalo. The professional guarded what we now consider alternative yeah. comedy. Somebody um, else gave her squarely gave her credit as well. Oh, she. I think she was it. She, I mean, oh, Bob I'm not, did Bob in his book. Yeah, I think Odenkirk. she pretty much. You know, I was with her in the in Boston, and there was just nobody was just doing that at all. No, nope- going up. You with, would have a notebook, notebook, scraps of paper, not nice not clothes, give a shit. not presentational <laughs> yeah. at all, and not doing, not doing like you know, set up punchline tag yeah. type stuff. I heard about you. I think. Well, I heard about you from. Well, this maybe was later. I was kind of roommates. Sam Cedar had an apartment in New York or an apartment in LA that I stayed in. And then John Benjamin would come out and stay there. Oh, yeah. Well, John was in, John and Sam were in my sketch group in yeah. Boston. Yeah. So, so did I know you back when? Not uh, really. No. When did I, was I just, meet I, you and, and your brother too? Yeah. Kind of probably in the time. 90s. Yeah. Late 90s. And then I was, me and Chappelle wrote Half Baked in 97. And then I but started. But you were in New York. You were in New York. Right? I was, but then I moved to LA quietly. <laughs> quiet <laughs> yeah under cover of night Shh, <laughs> yeah don't tell i didn't tell anybody. people a, a totally obscure person's moving <laughs> it's like when people make a big production of like hey guys i'm getting off social media for three months it's really toxic and you're yeah. like who the fuck are you yeah. <laughs> you and you're you're yeah. telling your it's you're 18, gonna realize seven followers yeah no you're gonna know and um this is not performative anyway that's why i told you um i'm interested i like you sent good blocks in which i'm happy about are you happy with your life? Because I I've always looked at you. I look at you with the same sort of category as like you and Marin and and people that are had. Uh, <clears throat> I'm going to put it in quotes. Integrity, artistic <laughs> and past tense. <laughs> integrity <laughs> and there was an anger to how you did shit. Right. And I always felt like because I would go to tapings and I was like very. I watched the. I watched Mr. Show. I think I've seen every episode several times, read name, we spoke about it, like a huge fan. You know, I would do things and I wouldn't consciously think, I bet Cross would think I'm a fucking sellout for this or whatever. But there was always this, this, um, not, I don't want to say superiority because you were so, it didn't feel like you were winning, but it felt like you, there was like a way to do things. There was a right way and a wrong way. Sure. Uh, and I do I do you feel like that looking back on that at was I right about that and do you still feel that way? There's a lot to sure. cover in that. Uh I don't I wouldn't say right versus wrong. I'd say it's first of all it's 
you know, integrity is subjective. You know, for some people, I'm a sellout. For some people, I'm not. And uh, I that was like uh, that's also a real '80s '90s term of like yes, yeah, sellout and integrity and all that shit. And I've talked about this before because I don't think it exists anymore. I don't. People don't even know what you're talking about. Yeah. Like sell out. They're like, what are you talking about? Did yeah. you get a Super Bowl ad or not? Right. Sell out is think, an ad that's not on the Super Bowl. I think to me at this point, and I'm going to jump ahead. And yeah. I'm gonna, at this point, I think it's about are you taking on everything? Like when I see to me, the thing that's uh, there's not a lot of distaste for stuff left. Mm -hmm. If if I know you're blatantly lying, then that's yeah. Uh, uh, you know, I I find that unethical, and uh, you know, there's no integrity if you are hawking something that you know is is bad, or the company behind it is bad. That is also um, lack of integrity. But for for me, it's like like if you're doing. Uh, Capital One bank mm -hmm. card ads and you're doing Amex ads and you're doing smart water ads. And, yep. I mean, that's just like kind of, and I, I do I do feel now in which I didn't when I was younger, um, yeah, fucking get the money, take the money. Yeah. Like when I, I remember um, hearing Modest Mouse on a, some car ad, this is 10 yeah. years ago maybe, and, and thinking, good. I mean, yeah. Isaac, Brock is a genius and he works his ass off and he's uh, he's brilliant and you know outside you know the records aren't making him a ton of money so yeah make make some money enjoy life you, you know You have a kid two kids I have a kid yeah Yeah which that changes shit I would assume as well in no, terms of well, like okay now I n absolutely need money and I'm a lot less I'll tell you rigid. what it's this may be surprising but not that's not the case. Okay. I I talk about this in my special. I think uh, I mean you know I have a rich kid, certainly rich by my standards. Yeah. Growing up, it bothers me, you know. And she's great, and she's smart, and she's all the things a parent would say about their kid. But she's spoiled, and it, and that bothers me. And I you know I really try to infuse everything that that is good about our lives with. You know, and we also live in Brooklyn, so we're we're around the corner from a treatment center. So I mean, you're going to see messed up people. She sees it on her way to school, to, yeah. from school. You know, you and you did that intentionally. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I uh, well, what I did was I got a bunch of people addicted. They didn't. Yeah, know. yeah. I, it's easy to do. <laughs> and so they now go to the treatment center, yeah. and it's you know, and you'll stage a fentanyl overdose. No, in the I, I'm totally 100% fentanyl free. That's part of my services. Okay. That's that's the David Cross promise. <laughs> if if I get you high, it will not. There'll be no, Clean. not even a trace of fentanyl. Yeah, but you will stay high for a good decade, and your <laughs> until life your is, daughter learns. Yeah, and uh, and I have to say, don't drink, don't do drugs. Look, look at that guy shitting himself. And you'd be like, play it up a little bit. <laughs> Yeah, hobbled right well they don't have to they like, no, yeah. I, I get them good stuff um so you have a rich daughter and that you've resented a little bit yeah i'm at the point where i've saved up a lot of money i don't if i had not married my wife i would have so much more money is that true I don't, oh yeah i mean i you're don't married spend, to an actress amber hamlin yeah. very successful popular she, actress yeah, she, and, and great actress. you know she's amazing she's you know we were raised wildly differently i mean she had uh she was the only only child she's been working since she was 11 and she had to like support her family growing up right I, kind of i mean sort of uh yeah. i mean her dad is you know a, a legend but they weren't getting a whole lot of residuals back in yeah. his day and and so yeah she she was a uh a breadwinner for sure yeah. but she also just gets money and spends it and doesn't really think like uh she doesn't know what a upi is you know uh, she when when you go shopping, there's no like I'm always looking at the UPI un, Universal Price Index tells you how uh, much. You, it, is it on the thing? I yeah, don't yeah, it's really to know the what left. UPI is. It's yeah. the most important number. So you'll see some olive oil, right? And yep. it's eighteen dollars and fifty cents, and you're like, Jesus Christ, that's a lot of money for olive oil. And then you'll see another one that's you know nine dollars and twenty cents, and you go, oh, I'm going to get the nine dollar and twenty cent, but. Because of the packaging and all that stuff, the UPI is the number uh, for how much you're paying per whatever ounce the, or whatever ounce or whatever the increment is, you know. And that's on the thing. 
It's to the left of your price number. Thank you. Yeah, it's the. Uh, trust me, you will. You will learn. You'll go and get a box of cereal, right? Well, I'm going to get the cheaper one. This one's seven, and yeah. that one's eleven. Well, you're getting a lot more product for your eleven dollars than you are for the seven. And they do it by ounce. They do it by like. Yeah. Met, they don't. It's not. Uh, It'll be right inch. there. Whatever. Whether it's liquid or Great. Uh, Great. Yeah. UPI. Look at the UPI. Fantastic. Number. Especially things like butter, <laughs> right? You're like, well, this butter's cheaper. They're like, no, not really. Not when you add it up. Um, anyway. And she doesn't pay attention as to, as no. I don't either. But like, here's here's an example. And listen, I'm not bitching. I love my wife. Yeah. This is, we're just very different people. I, I was one of three kids. My dad left us in mountain of debt. And my mom struggled. Uh, and we were latchkey kids. Obviously, she had to uh, work. And we'd come home from school. And we she wouldn't be home. You know, I'd have to take care of my sisters. And... We had no money, so there was. You had to make choices, and do you want, uh, do you want shoes or do you want this? You know, and and you learned about that, and you also learned not to waste a thing. You don't throw food away, and you don't buy more than you need, right? You buy what you need, and uh, just those little things from growing yeah. up poor that are. Uh, um, and listen, you know, there's another thing like, uh, I don't want. Uh, you know, uh, salmon mush uh, <laughs> out of a can with uh, powdered milk. That's what we got. Y- if you're hungry, you eat that. That's it. Yeah, and and you eat because you're hungry. So, uh, but there's none of that in our house. There's like uh, you and you believe that's constructive as a lifestyle. <laughs> like you think it's worth. Do you think it makes better people to grow up in some level of poverty or tension around money? I not necessarily better, but certainly more equipped to deal with adversity and literally anything that might come your way that is an inconvenience. I can sleep on a cement floor, I'll be okay. My range of what I can be not necessarily comfortable with, but uh uh when it comes to temperature. Like I can deal with a hundred degrees, and I can deal with it when it's twelve degrees. See, I, I just de- I don't bitch. You I'm know? with you because I didn't grow up. I grew up, whatever, and and uh, there are times when I think I'm better equipped for life, right? And then there are other times where I think if the shit went down or whatever, if there's some sort of giant shift in how people live, I kind of believe that rich kids your do- whatever would figure it out in about two days they would just adjust to whatever now if you're saying that what makes you say that because they would have to because people are well everybody people are, has to right but i'm saying we're pro we're pre we're the human body wants to stay alive right and you'll just adjust your standards to but but i will say you may be right if things remain calm that it'll be harder to study it'll be harder to do difficult things i don't know i don't necessarily agree with that i don't i don't understand why a person who has uh been privileged would have an easier time if uh oh i don't think it'd be easier oh i think it wouldn't be i think they would they would just still yeah their attitude yeah three days they'd stop talking about like it used to oh, he was rich <laughs> and he should they would just be like fuck it you just like in like a mill there's a there's a plot in platoon like the guy who's very like the sort of upbeat sergeant at the beginning mm-hmm. and by the end he's like i don't give a fuck yeah like he's just very he's like turned completely so I so I am with you in terms of like maybe people that grow up privileged are soft, but I also think like if they had to be hard, they would get there. But but I'm I'm with well, you. Let like, me let me add a little wrinkle to it. Um, I think privileged and insulated is not good. So privileged and you know you have a horse farm and then you go to boarding school right. and all that. That's probably not good. But privileged. And living in New York, where you see everything, that's a little different. I think that I could see your point of view there. Um, I think it's the insulation. And look, this kid is surrounded by love. What do you think of that relative to assuming you weren't surrounded by? Yeah. My mom's side of the family, my grandmother was ice cold, weird, odd lady. 
just cold. Yeah. Um, and I used to say, just as for my own amusement, I'd end a phone conversation with, uh, all right, I love you, Grammy. And then she would say, right, toe. <laughs> she wouldn't say just, it was weird and we and my sister and i oh, would always so great and uh and born then, in 1920 tw- yeah 20 something great yeah. and uh both my grandfathers died before i was born uh and then i had one grandma who was very warm um but she died of cancer when i was five or six and then and my mom's side of the family was just so it was my grandma. Uh, my mom and her brother who went insane when he was 18 uh, and was, you know, committed and uh, kind of nuts. Kind of. He was. Um, and uh, so very small. And then my dad's side of the family, which was very boisterous and and loud. And there were five kids, five or six. Uh, one, two, five kids. Um, and tons of cousins. They came over from England. And uh, my dad was, you know, on the boat and uh, and lived in the Bronx and Long Island scattered around. But, you know, big like it was really fun, kind of and and uh, very European in that sense. And um, but then, you know, we moved co- every year. We moved somewhere else. And uh, um, and then we moved to Georgia, back to Georgia, where I was born when I was nine and then my dad split and just, and we barely saw him and we just, the rest of the family just didn't have anything to do with us. I know they came down from my bar mitzvah. A bunch of people did. And that was really it. And like all the people, like they just, my dad wasn't involved. They just checked out. And so my daughter has none of that. I mean, she's just surrounded our in-laws uh, or my in-laws and my family were always up or, uh, her fucking uh, spring break uh, is coming up in a in a couple weeks, and we wanted to take her to Northern California, go see the redwoods, and uh, and you know my wife has family there, and she has multiple reasons to go. We'd go to San Francisco and Napa. see. Go to some nap. Yeah, do yeah, some- do wine tasting. Uh, um, she's got a very sophisticated <laughs> palate, um, but we make her you know spit no, it out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And so we had this, and it was Amber's idea, go up and see the Redwoods. Yeah, it'd be cool. She'll love that. And we could not get her. She was like, she was sort of into it, but she goes, she wants to go to Atlanta and hang out with my sister, sister-in-law, my mom. Like, we are we go to Atlanta like three times a year. You want to go for, for spring break? You don't want to go do this thing? Like, no, I want to see Aunt Wendy. Okay, all right. <laughs> you well, go to what's, when you say... That she's surrounded by love, my uh, the because you grew up not surrounded by it. I grew up not surrounded by it in certain ways. My thought is like again, growing up hard does make you pretty interesting. Yeah, as I a mean, person, I mean, and I'm... then you wonder does does growing up surrounded by love make you? I'm not gonna say your daughter's boring. Look, I don't know her, <laughs> but you know what I mean. Like, does it? If she's not gonna, she... Might, she might not be an artist, Dave. Is that what do you think? Uh, I'm f- quite happy with that. Yeah, that's fine. <laughs> um, she wants to be a veterinarian because uh, she learned, or she was under the impression that uh, when you put a dog down, you shoot it, <laughs> and she wants to be a veterinarian. So I, sp- I go with that. You yeah, know, I connecting those thoughts. I think she wants to shoot dogs. Sure, but uh, uh, I'm fine if she doesn't. Uh, and and look, I have the if you were going to start from scratch and like i want to build a comedian you uh-huh. know, i have all of yeah. the ingredients so it's not a it's not a surprise but yeah it's uh, funny because when you threw in bar mitzvah, i was like and you're jewish is you yeah. have fucking everything <laughs> everything <laughs> total um, package it was weird yeah i had a weird uh it wasn't and a the great... south and oh. england and abandonment and oh. and right ho yeah um <laughs> Yeah, so I'm okay. Well, that, we'll talk more about it. I would like to say I want to know a little bit of your background, if that's okay. Just please give me a give me a, one of ten kids, youngest of shit. ten. Yeah, youngest of oh, ten. Oh, Irish. Yeah, Irish oh, Catholic. Fucking and, ten. And uh, yeah, just like uh, the... alcohol. I'm the youngest. Alcoholic dad, violent, and uh, mom who did her best. And you know, well, that's also yeah. a recipe for comedian. Yeah, I know. Yeah. Yeah, my, oh my brother, Lord. two comedians in one family. It's not good. Yeah. It's not good parent. Um, <laughs> it's not good parent. 
<laughs> something went wrong. Yeah, there 20% was a, of the family. Yeah, uh, yeah something, something. Everybody did their best, but not they weren't that good. At, not a lot of natural talent. Um, you got to talk it to... Uh, Odenkirk about his. Uh, I want to talk to Odenkirk. Yeah, yeah because I read his book a, too. He's got a. Oh yeah, well it's in the book. He doesn't yeah. even. I feel really like the book was not. It. I feel like he didn't really. He didn't really. Yeah, it's tough for him. I mean, it's a yeah. tough thing. But yeah, his uh, his mom and dad were. You know, I mean, his dad died of alcoholism, and uh, and his mom was, you know, barely scratches that in the book. Yeah, and but his mom was like over the top Catholic. Like yeah, that's in, in, a, book. Yeah. in a very extreme way. Yeah, and uh, you know, and he's got uh, also a large family. Um, but yeah, you should talk to him. About yeah, it. I, w- I I wish I mean, and I say this as somebody who also I wish he was having more fun. He's having fun. He is. Okay. He is. He. I remember, uh, like I had been hearing about nobody his action movie yeah. for. Oh, seven or eight years he had been trying to get that thing he had, he had the he went idea and shot that a little would... bit of it himself right like he did like a sizzle kind of thing uh i, don't I remember know. seeing him and he had just come back from shooting like he was a... probably doing the stunt probably showing the stunt right, training yeah. and stuff he had been trying to get a project like that going for a long long time and then everything kind of eventually after years fell into place and he went and did I and he talked about it a lot. I mean, you know, we talk all the time, obviously, and uh um and it was a big thing for him. And then I went and watched the movie, and it's not my kind of thing, you know, right. but uh I could see obviously I knew the backstory, but I could see how much fun he was having. Okay, and good. He had okay, good. he had so much fun shooting it and getting it going and hanging out with those guys, you know, yeah. and uh I could tell. I could tell. Well, how you know what's interesting about you because you were partners, but you weren't like dependent on each other. I'm really. It's interesting to watch both of you, both of your careers, and like there were points where he must have been jealous of you, and then or not jealous, He's not but a like jealous guy. Not we jealous, know. but like when you're in a partnership, people compare you to each other. Right. And and there were points where like you're you were doing crazy really well and then he was doing really well. And I'm always like, I hope you guys are always and it seems like you're always friends. Oh God, yeah. Oh no, we're 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 very close. We're gonna climb Machu Picchu in uh, For real? Yeah, in May. Who's filming it? Okay. Um what's who's doing the content? Are you gonna are you gonna make a documentary about it? Uh, we are. We'll we <laughs> will we'll take I mean it'll be uh uh as minimal uh yeah you know one or two cameras and we'll wear gopros and you know i'm gonna get those fancy glasses with the cameras yeah, in yeah. Them. and uh yeah we're gonna go climb machu picchu but it's friend i mean yeah it's filming it is is was later it, the initial thing was like hey let's, let's do just this. do this i would like to quickly say in terms of like if you're not familiar with with uh, mr show uh there's a sketch called the audition that uh crosses the star up whatever no, star is no a big whatever the whatever sketch. <laughs> the, well the script is actually the star of that one but like yeah exactly the it's maybe the best comedy sketch i've ever seen and i don't say that i say that pretty well informed the monologue that i'll be performing now is from the play entitled the audition by gavin hollerwood can i use this chair sure mm-hmm. oh no, I started it. That's oh, that's part of the monologue. And uh, it's a good one. It's up there. It's fucking so good. There's just so that show is so great and so layered. And there's things just sitting here with you where I'm like hearing shit like scammy flammy mammy. <laughs> like yeah. see, me and Chabelle, you say scammy flammy mammy <laughs> constant fucking <laughs> constantly. <laughs> Um, uh, oh like, my gosh, and yeah. God and the Bible. The one that's a mother, uh, Tamara. Yeah, you are. You need to respect the baby, cause life is precious, and God and the Bible. There's just so many things. There's so many small lines. Oh my from scammy, that, flammy, my scammy, mammy. flammy, mammy. Oh my scammy, flammy, mammy. <laughs> I forgot. Oh, it's that. so fucking funny and it's nonsense it's just yeah. the tag on a sketch you break in and <laughs> sing my scammy flammy mammy and it's and there's 70 that was of such those a fun sketch and character to do i always like doing those 
really earnest guys who are yeah. clueless you know yeah. there's a little like, you're very good at that was and... that there was another guy yeah there was another guy that wore a scarf it was like an inventor rode a oh, common uh, bicycle uh, yeah yeah the uh the um right uh dylan i think <laughs> yeah i don't even know um Oh, that guy's like the pretentious, yeah. just, you know. He didn't uh, have TV. He didn't. I don't watch television. Yeah. Yeah, didn't I, listen. I, I don't eat raisins. <laughs> what? Why? Because it's not a true grain or whatever the thing yeah. is. I don't eat donuts or hamburgers or any other food that has approval of the masses. Yeah, I like Fart and Gary was, uh, was a character like that. Just earnest, trying to be nice and, yep. and just clueless. You also yelled at... And I think about it every time the weather's cold in LA, where you're like, it, there was something when maybe the first season you were filming in like a weird restaurant or something, and you oh, were like, yeah, and you were like, we fucking moved out here and we're <laughs> shooting in a fucking root or fucking it was broke a, down ass restaurant, and I think that every time it's raining, I'm like, I fucking moved out here, and this is what we get. It was yeah, it was some weird place on, on Las Palmas, I think just off of Hollywood and it was all we could afford. Yeah. And it was a bar. <laughs> it was weird. And they still had the the menu up there, like wingdings and things and whatever. And and you could literally hear crickets. There were crickets Fantastic. in the walls. And and our audience was bust in. We had an audience service mm -hmm. at that point. You know, it was a lot of kids from El Segundo who yep, didn't who quite, didn't really care yeah, for comedy <laughs> in general or your comedy in particular probably yes. didn't like your comedy no I, ask I remember asking uh, um, some there was a table we were you know stopped down or it was a restaurant or something yeah and I was like uh, hey so what do you guys think and this guy's like you could use a little more color in it <laughs> I'm like, all right legitimate it was just, you, know, you know old white guys yeah legitimate criticism yeah. looking back all right, let's do some blocks. This show is sponsored by BetterHelp. Can I ask you a question? What's the first thing you'd do if you had an extra hour in your day? Would you go for a run? Would you read a book? Would you show up for a friend? A lot of us spend our lives wishing we had more time. The question is time for what? If time was unlimited, how would you use it? The best way to squeeze that special thing into your schedule is to know what's important to you, and to make it a priority. You didn't think I was gonna pronounce priority that way, did you? Priority, real East Coast. Therapy can help you find what matters to you so you can do more of it. Listen, therapy, it's helpful, it's good. It's just good to talk your problems out. It's helpful for learning positive coping skills and to set boundaries that empowers you to be the best version of yourself. And it isn't just for those who've experienced major trauma. If you're thinking of starting therapy, give BetterHelp a try. It's entirely online, designed to be convenient, flexible, and suited to your schedule. Just fill out a brief questionnaire to get matched with a licensed therapist and switch therapists anytime for no additional charge. Learn to make time for what makes you happy with BetterHelp. Visit B-E-T-T-E-R-H-E-L-P dot com slash N-E-A-L today to get 10% off your first month. That's BetterHelp dot com slash n-e-a-l i've gone to therapy a lot of my life and it's had huge benefits that i talk about nearly every week almost boring if look if me and the guests weren't so damn entertaining it'd be a real snooze fest but thankfully we're naturally pretty pretty great what pretty great pretty great thank you betterhelp.com slash n-e-a-l all right let's do some blocks number one anxiety mm-hmm you, you, so you're, you have like standing anxiety. Yeah. Before I understood what that meant and I just had a, a very cursory idea of like, oh, you're anxious, you're nervous or whatever. Yeah. And I didn't really think about it. And I, I was, uh, and have been since I was younger, uh, like young, uh, prone to depression. And I always just assumed again, ignorance, oh, I'm a depressive i get depressed and and then i it got pretty bad um there was a, a couple of things that kind of triggered it when i was in los angeles and then i started going to a therapist which i had never done and she was amazing and then she recommended going to a psychiatrist the one mm -hmm, whoever the one can who describe gives, yeah. yeah and i started seeing the psychiatrist and He's the one who diagnosed me. He goes, uh, yes, you're, you've got anxiety. You've got this level of anxiety. And I, that was a real eye-opener because I didn't know what I 
true anxiety was. And then every when I was like it was functional. That was just your personality. Uh, not that's it's what I had and it's what I could treat and I could treat it uh, both with um, chemicals, which I did and do, and I can treat it by learning how to not go so deep like mm -hmm. le like come out of it a bit and i remember one time i was uh in a car driving and i was um uh at the on sunset trying to take a left on la cienega so do you remember that area yeah. and there's like a pink dot over yeah. there i was looking down i was looking my left and i was like down the hill and i was seeing the beverly center beverly connection and a beautiful view <laughs> Yeah, and I've been in LA for uh, maybe two years at that point, and I had like a real kind of panic attack. Like, I, I, attack is too strong a word, but it was just a it just, flood. A flood, yeah. yeah. It just t overtakes, and the light turns green, and I can't go, and people are honking, and I'm like, I'm just looking. It was, it was a, uh, it was. That is a. I will say. I've been not all over the world, but I put that in my top 10 most stressful intersections. <laughs> yeah. Because well, going up La Cienega, yeah. you, you're you rolling back. Yeah. And I was then, going down. I was no, at, I get it. Yeah. But I'm saying, and that left, it's two lanes. Yeah. There's, of course, the pink dot. You don't want to fuck up in front of the pink dot. You do not want to fuck no, up in front on. of the pink dot. No, come on. And uh, and there's two this but, way, this way, when down a hill. That was such a novel idea. Like, whoa, this place is like a 7-Eleven, but they'll deliver to you? It was incredible. There was nothing like it at the time. There were no apps, no. And you're like, we're you a get million toilet years paper, old. ice cream. Yes, yes. A Colt 45. Yep, cigarettes. And cigarettes and condoms and a frozen pizza. Yep. And they'll just put it yeah. in a car, bring it to you. Let me get this straight. <laughs> yeah, it was incredible. But yeah, so I had this, and I knew then I was like, okay, this can't, because I had little episodes when I was younger, and... A lot of it was, you know, having moved to Los Angeles and not liking L.A. and and also the thought of like integrity, you know, and all that stuff. Who am I? Am I being true to myself, et cetera, et cetera? And uh, and then I knew it was time to get some help, you know. You know what's interesting? I don't remember when you talked about this. Was it was either on a podcast or there was like a Guardian interview with you where you're just talking about cocaine, doing cocaine in England. Yeah. Where where did did I read that or I? heard you know. talk about it Either. do you remember doing a lot of cocaine in london not more than usual i mean there was a <laughs> there was like a uh, it was a because the... you don't seem very much like a drug guy you don't like read oh, as a drug I was, guy i was way i was uh, a big upper guy like i didn't like uh i was not a downer guy i didn't like lose yeah. or uh, i've done you know everything a handful of times like heroin was just not not worth it to me. Um, Did you ever do it? Try it? Yeah, yeah. And it you was know. like... Yeah, I mean, it's okay. Uh, yeah. I never shot it. Um, and it was... I probably did it, I don't know, I, maybe seven or eight times total. Um, heroin. Heroin, yeah. And uh, um, How many times would you say you've done cocaine? Oh, shit. Hundreds and hundreds. Great. Um, no one ever openly talks about cocaine. I'm I'm pro cocaine, uh, but it, like in any any drug, it has to be used in moderation. Yeah. I'm not a nor was I ever like. Hey, Did you read the like Carl Hart book Drug Use for Grownups? <laughs> no, it's a but he's a buddy. He's a he's a I like head the of title. he's he's professor at Columbia. Yeah, and the book came out two or three years ago, and uh, he's he's like you can do meth. Yeah, you can do all oh, this. You can do heroin. Crystal. You can do did, all this stuff. I did lots of crystal. I did loved you really? It. Yeah. God damn it, that's great. I had one specific rule. It was very, very important to me, and it's why I, uh, of all the things I've ever done, I've told this story before. I did crack in London, and this must have been the thing I heard. Yeah, and uh, and it was amazing, and I was. With two friends and three strangers, and, uh, and they were. I hope strange, everyone pictures you strangers. like smoking it out of a pipe, like a wood yeah. pipe, like a British oh, something like dignified those, uh, about Meerschaum yeah, like, <laughs> or whatever that's called. Yeah, like I'm Sherlock Holmes. <laughs> yeah. Um, we were there was this guy who uh was uh like a 
very well-known uh, town character figure in um, Camden, Camden Town, which was like the hipster, this yep. is pre-Shoreditch and all that, and pre-Hackney. So Camden Town was the the place. And, um, and this guy would perform in the back of a fish and chip place. And, uh, and he was kind of rockabilly, whatever. And, uh, and he just, everybody knew him. He was one of those guys. And I don't know how <laughs> it came to be, but me and two friends and that guy, and then these two older kind of funny cackly, uh, British women. Um, you ever read Viz, British no. comedy magazine? Uh, they have uh, they, there's a comic called Two Fat Slags, and they were kind of like them. Um, ended up at this guy's fucking tiny, shitty, dirty flat with a. Uh, uh, the one thing I'll never forget is a empty fish tank with uh, dirty dishes in it, <laughs> and we smoked crack. And I could not understand these women. These women were like Northern England, so yeah. that's really tough to hear and uh, um, to, to comprehend and uh, and their accents. And uh, and it was just weird, right? Yeah. And we smoked crack all night until the third time, maybe fourth time, and it was like, are we going to get some more? Because we kept buying more. And I was like, if I don't leave now. Because I was doing shows. I was there. I had a month at the Soho Theater on Dean Street, Soho. And uh, I was like, if I don't... Oh, I, I didn't even tell you my... I'm sorry. I have went through all this. So my rule, my one rule is if I ever fuck up a performance or can't make a performance because of drugs or drinking, I have to quit that thing. I have to quit. And that was my promise. You have to quit the substance, not comedy. The substance, yeah. yeah. If it's messing with with my ability to uh, be professional, to Carl deliver. Hart's rule is you have to sleep. Anytime people have psychosis from mm, yeah, drugs, yeah. it's because they haven't slept. Yeah, I mean, all I've the bath salt, been... which is a fake story anyway. But like yeah. any psychotic episode, the first question you should ask is, "Have you slept?" And yeah. the answer is always going to be no. Yeah. So he's like, "Take a sleeping pill. Do whatever you have to do." Yeah, that makes sense. I've been on, you know was on some benders where you just sort of come to you you not that you were unconscious but you're doing this stuff and you're walking around and then you just sort of regain clarity and you're like what it's 10 a.m i'm in Tompkins square park and i've got a tall boy in my hand what am i doing <laughs> go home it's time to go home <laughs> you know and uh but yeah i i i said no i gotta go and uh and that was the one and only time because it was great. Yeah. It's great. And uh, that's actually a joke, I think, from Mr. Show. It's oh, yeah, lie yeah, detector yeah, sketch. Yeah, yeah. Have you <laughs> yes, ever done crack? What about crack? Do you ever smoke yeah. some crack? Yes. Oh, dude, you're out there. <laughs> I hadn't done it at that point, but uh, Jay had. And uh, um, he was like, oh, yeah, it's great. Yeah. It's the funny, it's like the first time I've ever seen someone on television say, <laughs> Yeah, it's good. I think the line is, yeah, it's great. It's crack. Yeah. It's incredible. It's it was great. Up. It's crack. It gets you really... <laughs> but I was not a downer guy, but I loved doing, again, in moderation, and I wasn't like, let's do fat yeah, rails Yeah, would you do and... it like a, like celebratorily, or would you just do like, I don't know, feel like no, doing drugs? No, no. It was only as a, a practical function to keep staying out. So I would, I would not do big lines but i would have some and i would do bumps you know and we'd be out uh and i i was a a bachelor who's kind of famous with some money in the east village and lower east side with some celebrity and why the fuck wouldn't you do by that? the way the locus of your celebrity if you're gonna be <laughs> yeah. like you're extremely famous you're will smith in that in, in the that, lower east side yeah and Brooklyn. But I mean, I was having a blast. Yes. And I was going out drinking and meeting girls and hanging out with friends and going to shows. And and, and so I never did like, you know, uh, Coke or, like, you know, I'm not going to talk like that and I'm all jittery. I would just, it was, it was, as I said to my wife, it's like, it's, it's like a cup of coffee for your nose. <laughs> 
you know it was i wasn't doing like stuff where i was an asshole if it's enhancing like knock yes. yourself out that's so what that's I, what i that's how i did co so i did a lot of coke but i didn't i wasn't a cokehead i wasn't a fiend i just and it's also i you know literally i knew everybody there was a guy at every bar you just you find out who it is and you go grab a bag and that's it it's it's easy i mean it's you'd yeah. go and then you go in the bathroom do some bumps and you're like all right let's have another drink yeah great cocaine so yeah it's fantastic <laughs> um are you sponsored by cocaine <laughs> hopefully if you'll do a funny read on it yeah. um okay so the anxiety and you just sort of have now you take Zoloft or you take something I do. yeah i i'm on a, a very mild so i was on and off it for uh a long time and i was on it for a bunch it was great very helpful uh almost i mean not literally immediately but very soon and uh and i i, I remember into, taking Zoloft. it worked on like the third day yeah it was it was it was great yeah. you know and i didn't lose any part of my personality which was my big fear and it was really helpful, and um, and then I was I was in Turkey. I went to Turkey for a month, and I'd been on it for a couple of years at this point. And I was like having to take this these you know bring my pills with me, and I'm just ba like backpacking around Turkey, and I'm like, what am I doing? I have to get up in the morning and make sure by nine o'clock I have my anti anxiety. I was like, all right, I'm going to go off it, and I went off of it for a while. And then I found I needed to go back on. So I went back on. Uh, and then when I was, when Amber and I got together and we were serious, like right away, it was, it was basically, she moved in within weeks and that was, that was all she wrote. And, uh, um, that must, I, real quick, that must've been exciting. Yeah. I mean, to, no, like, no, fall we, in love and... we, yeah, we, uh, I mean, it was like very quick and, and we were just in, which I rarely did if ever was i would always like try to did you question it were you like is this healthy is this, is this right was... no great i mean i which kind of meant that it was you know i mean our age difference was always a uh, uh you know we were conscious of it um me more than her but uh uh yeah it's not an issue and and wasn't an issue um it was just, you know, the, it only. I'm just talking about the speed. Whenever you're like, whenever you jump into a oh, relationship, yeah, no, I'm I always understand. like, ah. Yeah, again, it just sort of felt like, oh, that's it's this what's going to happen. This has worked fine. And uh, I think in part, it worked early on too, because we were, even though we like moved in together very quickly, you know, she'd go work on a project for three months and, you know, I'd visit her, she'd come back and then vice versa. I'd go out, I, you know, I got a shoot in Vancouver yeah. for, or I'd go to uh, She's London. not the only one working in this relationship, guys. <laughs> and then I, I said, you know, I've been on, I'm on Zoloft. I think you should get to know me when I'm off Zoloft. And she said, okay, sure. So I went off of it. I was off for a long, 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 long time. And then when my daughter started school, I started, like I would always, if you ask my wife, we, we have a place upstate and um, that I've had since before I even met her. It's just, it's awesome. It's in the woods and it's great. It's tiny and I love it. But when we leave, when we go to leave, I'm always, uh, it's where my anxiety kind of tends to come out in a not great, you know, well, we got to be on the road by 2.30 and it's fucking two o'clock and I, you know, I'm not leaving here unless the fucking floors are mopped because I'm not going to, just... All right, chill out, dude, chill out. So when my daughter was born, I mean, that was all great and everything, and and I didn't really have those tendencies, but once she started school, I heard myself, could see myself doing this this behavior with a, a fucking four-year-old, five-year-old, whatever she was, like, Marla, we got. Sh you have to put your shoes on right now. We're gonna be late, and and just like chill out, you know. And it would just keep happening. Can uh, you see it? Because I, my girlfriend has a kid, and I can. She'll be like, I was a little uh, today, and I could see it affecting my son. Yeah. Can you? And it's like a symbiotic ecosystem where you're like, oh, I'm being a little crazy, oh, and it's yeah. making them a little crazy. Oh, for sure. And I'm and I'm I'm hyper aware of it now, especially because I've it's been a thing in my life and I don't like it 
I mean, I would make fun of somebody else if they were in my presence yeah. doing that. I would be like, okay, calm <laughs> yeah. down. It's all right. We're good. Everything's going to be okay. Yeah. And it's just a matter of whether you can control it. Even though I know what I'm doing, it's like I can't, well, well great. And, and it really came to four when... Uh, we were playing video games. I introduced her to, you know, they have games for kids that are really great. And dumb, dumb fucking, you know, put that peg in that thing uh -huh. and then you get the chocolate bunny or whatever the thing is. And I'm like, Marlo, you get, no, you got to go left. I'm like, a video game. <laughs> That's meant for children. Uh -huh. And I'm going, well, no, well, now we okay, got to start now over. Now you've done it. Fuck. And... <laughs> And uh, just terrible. And uh, and then I was like, all right, I gotta, I gotta do something about this. And so it was really when she started to go into school, I noticed it, and then I've been back on since. Great. Really low level, low dosage, but enough to prevent me from, from screaming at your daughter yeah. about a video game about pegs. Uh, no, block number two, which I'm looking forward to because I don't. No one's ever said this. The illusion of happiness. So the illusion of happiness goes, uh, it speaks to a little bit of what you had brought up very, you know, early on about the integrity and happiness and all that stuff and uh, uh, whether I'm angry or yeah. anything. It just makes me think you really have to search and, and yourself and dig deep and like, am I happy? Because I know I should be happy. Mm -hmm. I have everything you could want and what you you're living you this couldn't have gone too much better no i have so got as a, someone who's been aware of you for 30 years i'm like this worked out really good for cross yes you know there were moments where it might not have mm -hmm. and uh and i i suppose it goes to the this idea of wow, i should be happier right because i've got everything i shouldn't be depressed but depression is part of the human makeup mm -hmm. and uh and even uh the things that you know i have an amazing wife i have an amazing daughter i have a great in-laws my family's great we're you know relatively comfortable there are two things that are uh can make me unhappy the state of affairs in america yeah if you care about that it's like a yeah yeah it's, it's I, like a it's a commitment to misery in a weird way yeah or not in a weird way that's kind of what it is and it used to be le i don't know it did it seems like an especially uh severe well the, there's time. there's it is more severe it was always there yeah but you could there was a feeling of like you know up until uh six years ago there's a feeling of um or eight years ago, it was a feeling of, uh, oh, whatever, it's a cycle. You know, it's yeah. a pendulum. The pendulum goes and they'll, you know, I'll, these guys are assholes, but they'll be right. gone soon. And and it didn't feel as uh, weighty and uh, um, existentialist. Yeah. Like there's a, there's a feeling, a very real feeling of like, oh shit, everything we ever knew may go away. Mm -hmm. And that's uh, jarring and, and, uh, all the stuff that I grew up with, making fun of the Southern Baptists, that you know the the weird rules at my school, and I'd get in trouble for saying the word transvestite. What? Okay, and like all that's kind of just it's their anecdotes and their things that didn't really deeply affect me. But uh, the fact that <clears throat> those folks could, you know, have minority power in a yeah. very realistic way uh is frightening yep. you know and disturbing and upsetting so that's a constant thing um and i i'm a bit of a news junkie so i'm like you know opening myself up to all kinds of horrors that you know some people don't know and they're they're you know willfully ignorant and i kind of jealous of that sometimes like i don't watch the news yeah like <laughs> Okay. Um, and then the other is <clears throat> um, work. Work is the uh, perhaps the main thing that is drives my happiness or lack thereof. Do you think that's good? No. I wish it wasn't. <laughs> I wish I could be happy. In, for its own sake. It's like this with, with some vocations, certainly ours, um, 
where if you don't work for three months, you start getting itchy, like, and you really do think, like, am I ever going to yeah. work again? There's no other company. They you, don't, know, you, don't you don't go to a company to and yeah. try to No one has out. to employ you. I was kind of cocky in a way for a long time. Like, look, if I say something and I can't be hired anymore and Hollywood doesn't want to work with this bad boy rebel, <laughs> uh-huh. um, then fuck it, I'll just do stand-up. I can always do stand-up. And then COVID came, and that was a year and seven months, which is a lifetime. Mm-hmm. Like I can, In this business, it's a lifetime. I can't go more than a couple months without doing a set somewhere. Like, I have to. I got yeah. stuff to talk about, and I want to do it. And I like the, the thing that it gives me, where I get up on stage, and it's fun, and it's a year and seven months, man. Yeah. All of a sudden, I was brought down to earth and my cockiness about like, well, fuck it. I'll just, oh, I can always do stand up. It's like, no. Mm-hmm. And that was a eye opener. So the illusion part is. Is me, am I, why well, I said you got to dig deep. Am I tricking myself that I'm happy because I've got all these things that by every reason should make me happy. And I am happy, but am I that happy? Do you feel guilty about not being feel and yes. appreciating your position? I feel guilty and- about. I feel guilty about having money. I feel guilty about not being happy, not being more appreciative. Uh, not tremendous guilt, right, but, but I like feel it. Res- residual. Yeah. And do you do anything about it? Uh, cocaine. Fantastic! It's like a <laughs> cup of coffee for your nose. No, cocaine. I have not. I haven't done coke in uh, like since my kid was was born. Or since shortly after my kid was born, I I haven't done anything really. Yeah, good. I mean, so I that... drink. I still drink. I drink sure. a lot, but uh, I don't do. Also, I mean, this kind of coincided, uh, luckily, with the the like. I I would just do whatever you put in front of me, stranger. Be like, yeah, let's go in the bathroom. Let's find out what this is. What's going to happen? <laughs> and I enjoyed that part of life. Like, who knows? And. Um, but now and with, with a fent- bit of like, if it kill, if it's fentanyl, fuck it. No, no, this is pre fentanyl. I would okay. never do that now. Okay, I would never. Um, I mean, there've been, I don't know, half a dozen times in, in my life where I found coke. I you know, found a little bag of something like, oh, what's this? No, it's nothing. Or well, I don't know what that is, but it burns. But you know, and you, and I would never do that now. You know, yeah. Whether I had a kid or not, I mean, just like, it's it's, you know, it's a Russian roulette. Yeah. Um, I do play Russian roulette, though. There's a place in Midtown. <laughs> that's, that's, hey, that's you know, Dave and Buster's has Russian roulette. Do they really? Yeah, I've been mis <laughs> I've been misjudging that place. Um, this is interesting. Anger and dissatisfaction with your creative output. Yes, that is something. Because I would, from the outside in, you seem pretty fertile creatively. Uh, that's one of the things that when I was going to see a therapist, they were working on my ability to just go, okay, so you didn't come up with anything today. That's all right. I will get very frustrated. I also pro- procrastinate. I mean, it's on me, mm-hmm. you know? I'll sit down, like, okay, no distractions. Uh, uh, get, like, uh, uh, yeah. Here we go. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And then, you know, oh, wait, uh, what's going on in the game? Let me check yeah. this real quick, and then let me check my emails. Okay, yeah. all right. Oh, wait, wasn't I going to get a new carry-on bag because the wheels fucked up on my car. Well, like one of a, the wheels yeah, was like catching the, a little so bit I should and get I a need new, like, you know, yeah, hate to miss a flight because of a wheel. <laughs> that kind of thing. And I in and I was like, I'm going to write a memoir. And I, I had probably a good month of like working on it. But, uh, you know, re- in a relaxed way. And then I haven't fucking opened that document up in, I don't know, eight months. And I and I get angry at myself because then I'm like, okay, you can't play the video game until you do this, and then I'll, be, I'll find justification. Like, it's so funny because you're like, if I if you'd ask me to guess, I go, you don't have a gaming console. Oh yeah, Dave Cross do. does not have it. Oh, I, I remember it. Chris Rock told me one time he had to get rid. He was playing so much Madden, he had to throw it away, and if he hadn't, he wouldn't have written his movie top five. Yeah, he only wrote it because he couldn't play Madden. Oh, I, I absolutely believe that. And I, because it's like guys, and I'm like, no, these guys are like pure artists. <laughs> <laughs> I, but I, I have a real deep appreciation for 
the breadth of some of these video Grand games. Grand Theft Auto is the best the culture, is the most staggering cultural achievement of, I'm going to say, the last hundred years. And I, I say that well, dead on. Dead on. Yes, it's, it's, it's really fun. It's really impressive how uh, expansive it is. But there are some stories. There are games that the story and the acting and everything about it is, I, and I, I find myself saying this to my wife, who's not into that stuff at all. She's not anti, but right. she just doesn't enjoy it or get it. It's not her thing. But like the first, the Bioshock, the first mm -hmm. Bioshock game, still, I never saw that twist coming. One of the greatest twists in video game history. I didn't, I didn't play it. I don't know what the choice is. Someone told me what the it's, twist was for uh, this part two of the Rockstar Western game. Red, De Red, Red Dead, Dead Two Redemption told me the twist, and I was like, "That's a fucking such a cool twist." Oh, when we're done taping, I'll yeah. tell you the, uh, the Bioshock, Bioshock is fucking genius, genius. Never saw it coming. There are, and there are there are games where you just have this great experience. There's a a game, I think it was an indie game, uh, called uh, Life is Strange, that was just brilliant. I have a question, okay. which uh. uh I remember ha I remember being in Miami one time, driving al along and being like, when was the last time I was here? And I was remembering it from Grand Theft Auto 3. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and like, is, does that count wow. as a human memory? Do you know what I mean? Like, yeah, it was a good feeling. That's wild. It was a yeah. good feeling, a good memory of driving yeah. a convertible <laughs> in Vice City and then I was in the thing that it was based on and had the memory That's and I crazy. got the same oxytocin and dopamine yeah. and serotonin. I'm like, I don't know. That should count. And that was the first one with the great soundtracks, right? Yes. Yeah. So maybe maybe something was playing that yeah, was like Of course. Yeah. That's why I ran I ran so far away. And did you <laughs> And did you purposely uh, run over people and, walk I, and jump out and take their money? Like, uh, yeah, at first you do. Yeah. And then you realize it's only like 40 bucks. You're like, fuck, I'm not going to keep doing yeah. this. Yeah, I got, no, no. I have, I have shit to, I have to get on. You don't want to do a five star. I got to answer a mission and yeah. Yeah. Um, get to the garage. So, so yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah, no, that's it. I, I'm happy that you like video games. You know, you know, I feel like it, it, uh, it legitimizes video games. Uh, no, there's that some you, great, no, of course, brilliant, of course there are, but games. like it's a hard thing as people who grow. It's like it's still very, uh, and it's a massive waste of time. I disagree. Okay, great. I don't think it's a waste of time. You don't accomplish anything after your time, not like you do with writing or right. something. But it's it's no more a waste of time than watching a very satisfying tv show or movie it's no more a waste of time than even reading a book happy to hear you feel this way yeah because it it it's, will it's allow me of... i will only allow myself to do it so often but i think women hate them in my experience, <laughs> in video, experience for the most part there's plenty of female yeah no, there are no, but it's not but it's a very male domain i i oh, told sure. my girlfriend it's like knitting for men it's kind of just <laughs> like, like absent yeah, the, but it's largely a female domain, yeah. and sometimes men do it. And I would say the video games are knitting for men, just as cocaine is a cup of coffee for your notes. Okay, so what do you? And then have you accepted the your output is what it, it's just gonna? Do you have a natural sort of tidal? Like sometimes the tides come in, sometimes go out. Oh, for you sure, can't force yeah. it. You yeah. gotta chill, and but it'll come. But I think come. that's lazy justification for not working harder. You, it, it, it is true. You can't force it, but you can you can sit and try to get something out of your system and see if you stumble upon something. Have you written jokes that way? I have a hard time writing jokes that way. I've From never nothing. I've never written a joke. Uh, sat down and written a joke. I've Great. Never done it. Uh, all all my I'm doing them now. These uh, these shows. Um, the last four tours. Excuse me. In the upcoming tour i'll go out in the fall again is all i do this thing called shooting the shit seeing what sticks and then i'll go uh i'll start in a small you know union hall 99 seats whatever in the basement and i just have my notes and i go and i tape everything tape every set i ever do and just try to riff on these ideas and then slowly but surely you know you start 
getting this. Oh, that idea is good, and I'll put that. Yeah. And then you build the bit that way. That's how do you I do build everything. it when you're not on stage. If you know it's a good bit, you'll just sort of. I well, I run can I have transcripts of everything I've done, right? So then I can start constructing like, oh, I riffed this line, or I went off this tangent here because I'm very. You will look at it. Oh yeah, you will yeah. look at the transcript. No, I okay. have it, you know, typed up and I've yep. got it on my computer, and I go that line. Let's like that, and then I can build the bit from there and 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 have it written because it's all i've got them all you know i've got uh, at this point i've got 10 sets you, you had know? the first i'm remembering another bit i saw it on e entertainment television <laughs> uh it was about uh animal it was about vegetarianism and something about dolphins or holy uh, shit that's going or, that's or sorry that's yeah one of the... i'm talking about 30 years ago it was on Oh, that's one of the first, yeah. like, uh, you know, when you when you first kind of stumble upon that bit that is like, oh, this is like a signature. Oh, this is yeah, it gets no, a reaction. that gave off a heat signature. Like this is a this is a good bit. That was one of my first, yeah, good like, bits. Uh, oh wow, that is it old, was, old old. It was yeah. It was, there, I it remember was about well, it also came from a heckle. Like I did this thing. I was doing this bit about um, oh how we don't eat dolphins, but we eat tuna because uh, uh, tuna's ugly and it's okay to eat ugly food. Nobody, you know, that's yeah. why we don't eat adorable food. Whatever. And then somebody, I was doing that. This is in Boston. Uh, that's how long ago it was. Um, somebody said, "Oh no, we don't. We don't not eat." dolphins because they're attractive we don't we don't eat them because they're smart and then i riffed oh well if that was the case then we should probably be eating the retarded <laughs> and that got this crazy reaction like oh shit you know <laughs> and then i just sort of played with it in the yeah. moment and i was like oh well there's the bit yeah that's what and the, well i think the either tag or punch on was like and you go good with tuna <laughs> <laughs> no, or no, I'm sorry. And some fuck, I blew the punch. And you go good with mayo. Oh, it was it was like tuna. And sorry, tuna, you go good with right. mayo. So that's old, old, old. Yeah, old. I'm I a fan. Cross, that's... I try to tell you. Um, and then all right, so you just you've just accepted that you're you do your best, but but it's gonna come. The process is gonna be the process. And yeah, but I am uh, partly to blame, and it, and that's what is also it's uh, a vicious cycle, you know. Yeah. Because I will get angry with myself for procrastinating, and then not even though I, and then I'll justify it by going, well, you know, you can't force a brilliant bit, and then and I I think what helps is I just push away from the computer and the desk, and I walk outside. I go outside, and I live in New York too, so it's just nice. And and when, when I was, you know, I've run a couple writers' rooms, and uh, uh, when we would be doing uh, Todd Margaret in in London, and you just you hit this wall, and then it's just a matter of you know diminishing returns for how long you're going to stay there and try to figure out this fucking how do we get you know, this guy to go to the library because he's cross town, you know, trying to figure out yeah. some logic thing. And you just, you're just sitting there in silence and every two minutes, somebody go, what if, oh no. Um, you know, and then it's like, all right guys, let's go. We're going outside. We're going to go, yeah. we're going to walk around. Yeah. Let's go to fucking Spitfield market. Yeah, we're not going to get coffee. It. We're not going to get we'll come staring back at it. In yeah. 45 minutes. Cause that's a better use of time than, sitting here and you know and it usually is you know so sometimes i just gotta if it's not coming just go for a walk yeah good power right. walk a power there it's the only kind yeah. of walks we take guys have you had andrew tate on the show no i'd love to though oh, yeah, you yeah. Me in touch with nihilism and hypocrisy which is kind of what i open with in terms of observing you from afar yeah there was a righteousness there's a there has always been a righteousness to you uh, and when I say nihilism, I mean it not in the specific clinical definition, but the idea of nothing matters, pessimism, dismissal. Mm -hmm. um, and I can feel that way, and it's not a good way to feel, and that's a block for being creative, I think, and uh, and living a good life. Um, 
And part of that is because of the news I read and like, you know, good people, bad people win and good people go to jail or go get bankrupted or whatever. and um, Or suffer. Or suffer, yeah. So that is something that I kind of have to work at to... And and having a daughter has been uh, um, tremendously helpful, and I, and I've said this before. It's an it's something that I wasn't conscious of, but I became aware of, um, which is I because I got this kid, and um, I hang out with her friends. They come over, or I go to you know some other kid's house, and I hang out and stuff. It's not fair to her. It's not uh, right. And uh, I can't afford to have that nihilism, and I need to find the good in things and be optimistic about things for her sake and for her friends. So I, me, you and I can do that. I can get on stage and talk about this stuff, but it has, I, I have to for my own health, mental health, and for her mental health, be positive about things and that's just like i it's no you can't negotiate with it it's not like well it seems like dealing with my my uh my girl's kid that part of being a parent three and a half part of being a parent is like protect them as much and then as you can and then slowly introduce oh heartbreak and pain absolutely like that just slowly immerse them and like this is what the world was but just say we're heading in this direction well we're gonna inform you so much as a lot of it is about um fairness Mm. and the and and it's a it's a old cliche that's not fair well life isn't fair but i i don't just say that i try to explain in real ways that that are helpful and un, and and helping her understand things, um, life isn't fair for a lot of people. And for for example, I was mentioning the the you know the dozens of kind of junkies and pillheads and whoever uh, on the on the corners of uh, of our street because of the treatment center and um and it's not just like i mean i use it as a as a way to go like well i think he's fucked up on drugs um i wouldn't say fucked up i he's he he took some drugs and it's making him not understand reality and he's uh you know it doesn't allow him to make good decisions and et cetera et cetera but it's also about you know i will sneak something in there about um you know uh you know maybe you know who knows why but you know maybe there was something that led him to that that you know maybe he didn't maybe his mom and dad weren't around and you know just things that it's uh, not uh the it, it's not a moral failure right it's just like he had a nervous system that couldn't deal with the world you know and maybe he didn't get a opportunity uh you know maybe he wasn't able to and i just little things like that i I don't just simply go oh yeah that dude's fucked up yeah he's a fucking bum you know or whatever so you know she knows my uh that i had a bad dad you know because she doesn't have she has because you won't shut the fuck up about it go ahead (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> hey, who, how do you think we got this house? Um, <laughs> if you want a house, you'll let me leave yeah. too. Uh, so you know, she she's aware of that, and like, because uh, you know, there's Grandpa Russ, uh, but there's no, you know, my my side of the family, and 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 you know, explained it to her, and and she knows that, and she knows there's kids in school who just have one parent, you know, and uh, and so all that stuff. I think it's a good, it's 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 good to have an understanding of like, this is the world and this is how it works. And, and perhaps there's a bit of like, I guess I'm lucky, you know, to be appreciative of the things that she has that other kids yeah. don't. Um, all right. We got to wrap. My question is my final question. I'm a big fan but like, what's, what's your goal for yourself with all this stuff with your, what's your goal for your emotional life? Well, I'd like to remain happy. I'd like to um, uh, uh, 
foster a uh, a, a fun atmosphere at home that's you know that's uh, uh, chill that's like um, you know allows for uh, Marlo and my wife to not have to worry and to grow creatively and as people and uh, um, and I don't want to be a cause of stress for anybody um, you know uh, so emotionally that and uh, um, I, I've since she was born and I've gotten to be a better person for sure. Like I used to have a real problem. Uh, I did not like it, uh, hanging out with people after a show. And I used to, uh, be really uncomfortable and I'd run away, run to the tour bus. I didn't want to talk to anybody. And then, and I couldn't take a compliment. I was just a kind of a jerk that way. And, uh, or jerky behavior. I don't think I was a jerk, but it could easily be con seen as like well that guy's yeah why do you run away when i said hi uh -huh. you know um but on the last tour i did meet and greet so i've come a long way and i was really cool about it and people everyone was appreciative and i could not have done that five years ago no way yeah i just i'm so i'm better that way and that, that was something that i worked on what it what was what were you working on like being generous to people who like you or being generous to yourself or accepting to, to people love or who, compliments? to people all of that if i was out eating with ambers you know before marlo was born and people like hey can we take a picture and be like hey man i'm eating you know uh, like to the point where amber would get uncomfortable and i learned to be better about that of like you know what maybe not now but uh after if you're around for sure absolutely and just be more pleasant and not yeah. be so brusque about it and um I'm, I'm a lot better at that now and have you know last five or six years i've gotten much better about that i would when all said and done and i pass my goal is that i'm considered one of the top 400 stand-ups uh in the eastern part of the united states to which i say Stick with it. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my scammy, flammy, mammy.